you're very welcome to the launching of this uh, status report on Brexit, uh, which follows on from a volume that Paul Gillespie and I edited here four years ago, uh, which we called uh, Britain, or the United Kingdom and the EU, the end game. And what we've tried to do with this is to bring you up to date on what has happened uh, since then in under various headings. I hope you've all got a copy. Um, and you can see in the index itself uh, what's covered. Um, the book is edited by Paul Gillespie uh, and by Andrew Gilmore uh, and myself. And the various chapters are mostly by members of the UK group in the Institute, uh, joined with a, a number of others, uh, two at least of whom are on the platform. Before I introduce the speakers, um, I just want to thank uh, the staff of the Institute uh, and particularly Andrew Gilmore and Sophie. I never get your name right. Where are you, Sophie? Is she here? Yes. There you are, Sophie. Thank you very much uh, for all of the work they did in putting this publication together. There's a lot of work, and the staff of the Institute uh, worked to do this, uh, and I want to uh, thank them uh, for it. Um, so we have four presentations of about five minutes each. Uh, and then we'll take a discussion and a question and answer session on the usual rule, the Chatham House uh, rule. Uh, and the first to speak will be John Palmer. Uh, John Palmer was for many years the European editor of the Guardian newspaper. Uh, he's well known in this institute uh, and he's a man, I think, who understands what happens in Brussels and who understands what happens in the British Labour Party as well as any person I've ever met. It's always a pleasure to hear him. And John is going to try and say a little something about what has happened in the UK on the whole. John, you're very welcome. Thank you, Daddy. I never knew you lived such a sheltered life. <laughs> but uh, a great pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, as I say, I make reference in my uh, contribution to this report, uh, it was St. Paul who said, uh, now we see through a, d a glass darkly, uh, but at the end of time all will be clear in a letter to the Galatians. And I think on that principle, the end of time might be, as far as the British election is concerned, somewhere, and the end of time, therefore, uh, around Friday afternoon at four o'clock, if not with the uh, uh, opinion poll, uh, uh, poll at the end of the uh, counting. Uh, this is a, an incredibly... Uh, uh, tense and incredibly difficult election to call out, but it takes place against this background of um, a Brexit crisis which is really only just beginning. If you think you've been through the Brexit crisis, I bring you bad news. It's going to get much, much worse. Much, much worse unless there is a change of government. And a change of government doesn't mean to one party, it might mean to some alliance of parties or coalition of parties, I don't know. All I know is, whatever I would like the outcome to be, nobody is able to call it with any authority whatsoever, especially with the latest trends in, in the polls. Uh, but the fact is that on the assumption that uh, Boris Johnson forms the next government uh, next week sometime, uh, we begin a turbulent process that seems to me only likely to lead to the well-known crisis of deal or no deal whatsoever in a matter of relatively few months towards the end of next year. Uh, people don't fully understand that the Commission will not even be in a position to begin negotiations till they've secured a new mandate for those talks. And this in a new constitutional setting, <coughs> unlike the previous negotiations on the exit terms, which were essentially in the hands of the Commission with a broad mandate, this is a shared competence negotiation in which member states can play an active part in the specifics of, the, of, the, of those negotiations. Uh, therefore, it's very hard to see serious talks much beginning before Easter, uh, and uh, 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 very soon after that, a very few months after that, there would have to be a decision to call for an extension of Article 50, yet again, uh, rather than end up, this time, de facto, in a no-deal outcome. 
a, a, a no deal outcome which it might be very difficult at the 11th hour of the 11th minute to secure uh, a, an escape when there are so many other parties now in the negotiating process. Not, uh, it's not simply uh, with uh, uh, Michel Barnier and, and uh, the President of the Council. Much more complex negotiation. The question is, uh, what will the British government's uh, stance be? At the moment, that stance in the hands of the Prime Minister is to go for uh, all the advantages of free trade with the European Union with the minimum or zero undertakings to observe common standards, regulation, single market, customs union, etc. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in my opinion, naive belief that because it would hurt both parties, and it would hurt both parties seriously if there were nego no negotiations, that some uh, magic formula will be found. I don't think it will. I would not exclude the possibility that Johnson at the last minute would do another swerve the car back onto the other side of the road and try and soften the deal uh, by giving significant concessions. I wouldn't rule it out. I have no evidence that he will do this, don't get me wrong. But I know him personally and uh, have been worked with him, haven't helped me for um, some years. Uh, he's quite capable of doing that kind of uh, uh, U-turn. The, the last things I want to say concern the future of the UK itself in that scenario. Firstly, I think we could expect, if there is a Johnson victory, the Scottish situation to rise to red-hot temperature with a demand for an early uh, 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 referendum on Scottish independence, as opposed to if there were to be a minority government, it's very clear from what the SNP are saying, they would go for a formula of looking favourably at the idea of a referendum after a period of some years, after a, some passage of time. Thirdly, uh, there is going to be a massive uh, pressure to form a, to forge a new constitutional convention. Strangely enough, this is not only coming from people who um, uh, have exhausted patience with a uh, uh, no written constitution. The Prime Minister himself is talking about the idea of a new constitutional convention in order to restrict the judiciary further from the kind of intervention that it made a few months ago on, uh, 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 on the illegal proroguing of Parliament. Thirdly, there is now, uh, believe it or not, uh, a serious opinion poll putting support in Wales for independence, independence at 30%, roughly speaking, which has not been seen, I don't know, since when. And fourthly, there is a huge pressure from the big cities in England to push through a re-equilibration and a recasting of the power relationships and the decision-making relationships within England itself. As far as uh, Northern Ireland is concerned, it could be, I don't exclude this, I, I've, I've stopped predicting anything as far as election results are concerned. If it's really tight, really tight, it could be that two or three new members of parliament from the, from the north of Ireland who are willing to take their seats swing the balance. It, it carries on those tiny, or could carry, on those tiny uh, margins. So uh, I think uh, in one sentence to conclude, it's going to be a very rough ride. Uh, I think that the European Union will endeavour to uh, find a solution that keeps Britain more or less consistent with key social environmental trading relations. I fear they will not succeed in that endeavour, even if the Prime Minister himself were personally minded to do so at the end of the day. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, our next speaker is Paul Gillespie. Paul is a member of the UK group in the Institute. He's also a director of the Constitutional Futures uh, After Brexit uh, group in the British-Irish Studies section in University College Dublin, and of course he's a former foreign editor of the Irish Times. Uh, Paul's going to talk to us about Scotland. Thank you very much. Um, the chapter is entitled Between Two Unions, uh, between the European Union and the United Kingdom, and Scotland faces a fateful choice uh, in the in coming years. Uh, which may be indeed accelerated, as John was suggesting, uh, during this time. Uh, Sturgeon uh, uh, made an interesting, straightforward remark uh, about the election 
that she said it was Scotland's chance to escape Brexit and put our own future in our own hands. And that's putting it very clearly. And that linkage is what we've described in several of the studies we've done in the UK group, is that the UK is facing, uh, in this fateful time, a dual sovereignty crisis, which has its external uh, aspects vis-a-vis -vis the European Union and its internal aspects vis-a-vis -vis the very future of its own union. And so the Scottish, uh, the Scottish issue is a real swing issue in the middle of that. We quote in, in the chapter Tom Devine, very well-known uh, Scottish historian, who makes the remark about the UK's own future uh, that its, its, fate, its fate will be determined by what's happening in England, and that when uh, he, he also refers to uh, another uh, well-known analyst in Scotland, Michael Keating, who said that such unions break up not from the peripheries but from the centres. And it's very important, therefore, to examine, including obviously from an Irish point of view, um, the, uh, what is happening in this union, in, in, in our next door neighbour and on our island, um, and to think prudentially and tis in an anticipatory way and in terms of preparedness about what might happen. And in Scotland, um, the uh, polling evidence shows that after the referendum on the EU in 2016, there's been a slow but steady shift uh, in, in, in attitudes uh, towards independence from around the mid-40s towards 50-plus in favour of independence. And if you analyse this in terms of age, you find that something like 25% of people over 65 are in favour of independence, uh, but it's a very very different amongst younger age groups uh, where it's, it's predominantly, uh, uh, the, the, the drift is there. When you ask Scottish people what they expect, 70% of them expect Scottish independence uh, in, in, in the near to middling uh, term. Um, the, um, uh, and you can play with these figures and analyse them, but that steady drift is there. It's, it's it, interesting looking at, if you like, the psychology of the Scottish and this and the way the SNP has managed this. They've played a medium to longer term game. It's, it may, some things may accelerate, uh, but they, uh, they believe that they're in a position to make this demand for an independence poll and to see it delivered on. And of course, as John was saying, the bargaining will go one of two ways. Uh, if it goes uh, uh, towards a, a conservative-led government, uh, we see an acceleration of the pace and uh, of, the, of the radicalism uh, of this issue, and an awful lot will turn on how hard or soft uh, the Brexit turns out to be. The problem, of course, there, the harder the outcome, the more uh, the uh, surge towards an independence vote, uh, the harder the border potentially between an, an independent Scotland uh, and England might be. So it mirrors and reproduces some of the issues we've had in Ireland. Um, in the work we've done in, in, um, in UCD, in this project of constitutional futures, we've produced a, pr a brochure on it which uh, is available also online, we've talked about two major drivers of change uh, in, 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 in the internal arrangements of the UK. The, the first is that issue of the harder or softer Brexit, the whether or not policy in the, in the UK uh, converges with the, um, with the EU regulatory system or diverges from it. Uh, and that's still the major issue driving uh, uh, policy making as we see it. Uh, the second, though, is the extent of the centralisation of power uh, within the UK, uh, whether it's and the effect of Brexit on that. And there's been a, a re-centralising effect, very marked one, uh, coming through the Brexit crisis. And uh, John's reference there to the uh, item in the Conservative Manifesto saying that you want to look at the judicial review issues and indeed look at in, in a wider setting would tend to reinforce that. The so-called Henry VIII powers that are uh, been invoked in dealing with trade arrangements and in dealing also with the question of where you locate uh, decisions about, about Brexit within the UK system bear that out. So if you combine these, as we've done uh, in, a, in, a, in a mapping exercise uh, in, in our project on constitution futures, drawing on the work we've done in, in, this, um, uh, in this institute, we come up with a mapping of four potential outcomes constitutionally uh, within the UK. 
Um, they range from the most radical, the two most radical, the first of which is breakup. Uh, by way of Scottish independence and by way of major constitutional change potentially in, in Ireland, with a knock-on effect to Wales uh, um, if, if it goes that way. That's the one, perhaps the, you could say, the most radical outcome. There's another radical outcome which would head that off uh, and requires will and capacity to do that, and that's some kind of federalisation uh, of the UK in which you would inscribe uh, 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 the constitutional uh, shared powers uh, by, by agreement uh, into a document and in which you, you, you deal and centrally deal with the, all the issues around the governance of England that John again has, has referred to. In between those, there is what we call uh, a reformed or reimagined <coughs> union, uh, which uh, is something that would be aimed at, particularly perhaps by if there was a, a, a Labour-led uh, minority government, or a differentiated union in which you, they would accept that the Northern Ireland might go a different way and Scotland might go a different way. I haven't time to go into this in great detail, but we're, it's the kind of thing we need to do to think so seriously about the uh, future of the UK, so it's better to to understand the future of Irish policy making vis-a-vis uh, -vis the European Union, but also Irish policy making vis-a-vis -vis the future of, 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 of this state itself. And that can range from, there's been a lot more talk about this, that's some, this is something we anticipated in, in our work in the Institute. Uh, it's now being mapped at the beginnings of a mapping. One can think about uh, uh, something that ranges from uh, uh, um, uh, a, a, a proper re-establishment of the Belfast Agreement institutions and an elaboration of those, a filling of those out east, west and north, south through confederal arrangements, uh, through uh, the urge towards some kind of, of unity a referendum uh, and, and, and then if you go in that direction you have to think about the very shape of such a changed Ireland. Now this is, these are mappings we need to do and think about. I know the politics uh, of this and the urgency of this and the whole, the, the, the time scale of this is a matter of high politics uh, in this island, but what we're trying to do in this work, both in this, in, in, in this institute and in, in other work, is to try and give some people a, an overall mapping of it so as to better handle uh, the turbulent change that's on its way. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Our next speaker is Dan O'Brien. Dan O'Brien is the chief economist in this institute <laughs> and as you all know, uh, a very distinguished journalist with a, a long record of good work, Dan. <coughs> Thanks, Dari. Uh, so, uh, given that everyone has got to talk about uh, the, all the uncertainties today, I thought I'd talk about a little bit about the uncertainty effects of economics in general. Uh, secondly, specific issues around Ireland and Brexit uh, economically uh, since, the, uh, since the referendum. And finally, then speculate a little bit on the scenarios coming down the line. So uh, as an economic forecaster, there was almost a, a golden rule. More uncertainty means damage to economies. That consumers, and businesses, if there's political uncertainty or uncertainty around policy or tax, that tends to dampen economic activity. And that, that has always been a kind of iron rule of economic forecasting. It does seem to have broken down a bit, and this gives some reason for optimism that maybe Brexit won't be as disruptive, and maybe say that more out of hope than, than expectation. But we take a whole range of things. Government formation in Europe has taken longer uh, in recent times. We see Spain has gone without a government. Very difficult in the economic data to see that uncertainty from the lack of government in Spain feeding into the Spanish economy. Uh, governments have become less cohesive in, in many countries, minority governments, confidence and supply arrangements ourselves here, again, doesn't seem to have had a negative effect on the Irish economy, that we've had a weaker uh, minor minority government kind of arrangement. Uh, populists coming to power. The United States, uh, the ultimate case, and again, doesn't seem to have fed into a negative uh, shock for the United States economy having such uh, an uncertain, uh, uncertain uh, uncertainty around its leadership. And then, of course, there's Brexit. Um, so let's you know look at what, what the implications of Brexit for the Irish economy uh, explicitly since, since 2016. It certainly, if I had been forecasting in, in 2016, I would have thought that there would have been a marked negative effect on the Irish economy via two channels. First of all, just the uncertainty effect would have caused businesses to, to maybe say, let's hold off on investing in plant and machinery or putting our money in a new <coughs> factory or, or, or office. 
That really didn't materialize in the aftermath of the referendum. Uh, the second channel was via the exchange rate. So before the referendum and after the referendum, there was a very sharp weakening in sterling. For Irish exporters to the British market, uh, that was always going to make their goods more expensive in the British market. So you'd anticipate that a, a loss of competitiveness via the exchange rate would have dampened Irish exports to the UK. Could I just draw your attention to page 115 here in the report? And you don't need, need to be an economist to see the trend. Irish exports of goods and services to the UK over the past 15 years, uh, you'll see the trend line there. And look at 2016. Very difficult to see any sort of reflection <coughs> point around the referendum, around that period of uh, exchange rate depreciation, sterling depreciation. So it seems to be, have been very little impact or discernible income impact uh, for, Ireland, for Irish exporters into the UK market around that period. Uh, so again, maybe reason for hope that if there is a further dep depreciation of sterling in the times ahead, that it may, that exporters may uh, be, be able to, to weather that and manage that. Finally, to just build on some of the, uh, particularly John's, um, uh, John scenarios um, from an Irish perspective. There seems to me to be four scenarios, uh, two under a Labour-led administration uh, and two under a Conservative-led uh, administration. Let me put these in order of disruption for the Irish economy. So a Labour-led administration that puts a new deal to a referendum and the British people reverse the decision, there's no Brexit. Clearly the least disruptive of the possible outcomes. Labour-led administration negotiates another deal with the EU, uh, probably involving the customs union. Again, that will be a lot less disruptive than the current uh, uh, proposed ar arrangement. The third scenario under a Conservative-led government is that, as John suggested, there's a swerve next year. Britain leaves on January 31st, but during the transition period over the course of next year, there is a swerve and there's a further transition potentially for a year or two years, and that means that really nothing changes for anyone for at least two to three years from now and potentially longer. And then, of course, there's the possibility that with a um, much more pro-Brexit uh, Conservative Parliamentary Party that there is a demand uh, that there is no extension of the transition period, which, which must be decided by the middle of next year, uh, and then we face the no deal scenario, and I think uh, all of the hope in the world is not going to uh, wish away that there will be very serious imp implications if we get to the end of next year and there is, another, there is a no deal. Thank you, Dan. Our final speaker is uh, Dr. Katie Hayward from uh, Queen's University in Belfast. Um, she's working full-time uh, with a group called the UK in a Changing Europe um, on the implications of Brexit uh, on Northern Ireland uh, and on the, the Irish border. Katie. Thank you very much, Dahi. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk specifically about Northern Ireland and where things stand for Northern Ireland in light of all this uncertainty. Um, so there are three things to bear in mind um, when it comes to what Northern Ireland needs to sustain peace. And the first is stability. Uh, the second is a normalization, if you like, of politics and political decision making. And then um, the third is economic development. Now, if we look back over the past 21 years, we see that economic development isn't great. Uh, normalization is yet to happen, but we have had stability. Um, unfortunately, of course, that's been underpinned by a close British-Irish relationship, and unfortunately, Brexit puts that under pressure somewhat, and I mentioned this in the, in the chapter. So in light of all of this, where does this leave us? What's, what are the prospects? Well, one way of thinking about what the phase that we're coming into is really a time between times. So that's why the phase transition period is a, is a good one, because we know actually uncertainty continues in many um, regards. And one thing we've learned over the past couple of years is that uncertainty isn't just a condition, it's a force in and of itself. So I'm just completing a re third report for the Irish Central Border Area Network looking at the impact of Brexit in the central border region. And one thing that's come out from this research um, is the fact that uncertainty um, has an impact and it's meaning that um, Brexit has already had a very direct and tangible effect, particularly in the border region. So we know uncertainty isn't just a vague environment, it's actually a force and that's worth bearing in mind. Um, so Northern Ireland faces 
uncertainty from all quarters, and it also faces uncertainty even in the very nature of the protocol itself. So just to take it at the biggest, on the biggest front, we see for Northern Ireland, the uncertainty comes from the fact that the UK is making huge decisions right now. Um, and it has to decide which gravitational pull it's going to lean towards. Is it going to lean towards the US? Which means, of course, a hard Brexit. And we know that that's very much top of the priority, reportedly so, uh, um, for, for, uh, the, for the Conservative government and maybe uh, the next one too. Um, or the gravitational pull towards the EU, which of course would make things a lot easier uh, for the British-Irish relationship and for Northern Ireland going forward. Also, of course, the UK itself, as has already been very um, clearly described, the UK itself um, faces uncertainty. And the position of Northern Ireland in the UK does feel to be somewhat insecure um, in light of what's happening and the pressure that's been placed on the Union um, as a, partly as a result of Brexit. And again, I discussed this in the chapter a wee bit. Um, and what we see, if we have some uncertainty in the Union itself, this leads to increased polarisation within Northern Ireland. So de a destabilising factor um, um, uh, um, is exacerbated by um, the sense that the union of the UK is under pressure, and that's worth bearing in mind. Then to turn to the protocol. So it is a remarkable achievement in many ways, partly because to get the protocol, the EU breached two of its red, li red lines. The first is the red line about not discussing the future relationship before the UK was out. The protocol is about the future, and it's there in black and white. The second red line that was breached was about not to compromise the integrity of the single market and customs union. And although the EU uh, factors would disagree with me, I think actually there is a risk to the integrity of the single market and customs union, and would be very wise to bear that in mind when it comes to thinking about how the EU will, will be alert to what happens um, at the edges of Northern Ireland um, in the uh, into the future. Um, the protocol brings certainty in many ways. It really does help to avoid a hard, border to a hard Irish land border to a certain extent. But in another way, uncertainty is written into the protocol. Firstly, we don't know what goods are going to be designated as being at risk and therefore which will be subject to controls moving from east to west. Um, so that is uncertain and unknown. And also, uncertainty is written into the protocol in the form of the consent mechanism. Uh, so the fact that Northern Ireland MLAs, whether they're sitting in Stormont or not, will get to vote on uh, whether Northern Ireland will align to uh, continue to be aligned to the rules of the EU uh, to avoid the hard border, or whether Northern Ireland will revert to aligning back with GB, whatever GB is doing at that particular time. So there is a prospect. I know we wouldn't have this protocol if it was seen as a very uh, um, a likely one, but it, it is there is a prospect or a possibility that we could be dealing with the question of a hard Irish land border at some point down the line, be it 8, 16, 20, however many years. Uh, so that means uncertainty is there in the protocol. So looking ahead, how do we deal with all of this, with this huge sense of instability and uncertainty as a force um, affecting politics and society and economics in Northern Ireland right now? I'm going to suggest three things, and they're very, they're not, they're not, radical. <laughs> but if we get them right, it will, it will go a long way to, to helping things. The first is sensitivity to unionism and unionist concerns. So one thing that, is, that I've been reminded of doing this, uh, writing up this report for the central border region is that, of course, and it's, it's obvious, borders are about lines of distinction. And borders are about distinction that has practical legal effect. Um, and it's also about distinction that has highly symbolic effect as well. This is also true of the Irish sea border. So if the Irish sea border is seen to be more important, as it will be with the protocol in place, uh, that has practical effect. The extent to which is almost, you know, it's, it's, it's almost a side point. The symbolic effect of that can be, uh, is, is highly significant too. And we need to be sensitive to that and it needs to be handled very carefully, I think. Um, a second, uh, suggestion or recommendation is in relation to re representation. So there are mechanisms for, representation, for representing Northern Ireland's views vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the implementation of the uh, withdrawal agreement um, through the um, Joint Consultative Working Group, through the Specialised Committee. Um, there are many concerns that Northern Ireland has 
um, and they can be um, articulated and represented to Brussels um, um, through um, an imaginative use of these mechanisms. They have to be spelled out and we have to have an ask. Um, but I think there's a possibility there of not just having same old, same old. We can have stakeholder representation, civic representation in these groups that could have, um, in these forums that could have meaningful effect if they're properly um, used. And then finally, information. So one thing that, we, that is very obvious is that people are not, don't feel informed. They feel um, anxious about this, this withdrawal agreement and about Brexit more generally, of course. Information uh, can be sometimes alarming, but it's empowering too. And I think there's a very, um, there's, a, uh, there's a, you know, a very pressing need for information to be disseminated and clearly articulated. And with that, I want to commend the Institute for the publication of this report and say keep up the good work. Thank you.